हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर अद्वैत एंड वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर थर्टीन फॉर सेल द यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ सो एज यू ऑल ऑलरेडी नो लेट्स फर्स्ट हैव अ क्विक रीकैप ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव डन इन दिस चैप्टर सो फार सो इन द वेरी फर्स्ट लेक्चर वी सो इंट्रोडक्शन टू सेल इन लेक्चर नंबर टू वी स्पोक अबाउट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ माइक्रोस्कोपी एंड द सेल थियोरी In lecture number three, we spoke about parts of cells, basics of genetics, characteristics of a cell. In lecture number four, we spoke about the nucleus. In lecture number five, we spoke about the various plastids. In lecture number six, we spoke about the mitochondria. In lecture number seven, we spoke about ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum. In lecture number eight, we spoke about Golgi bodies, lysosomes, and vacuoles. In lecture number nine, we spoke about the cytoskeleton. In lecture number ten, we spoke about the plasma membrane. In lecture number eleven, we spoke about the cell wall. All of this, dear students, was in relation to the eukaryotic cell. So the first eleven lectures that you see here were completely about the eukaryotic cell. In the last lecture, that was lecture number twelve, I started off with the prokaryotic cell, and in today's lecture, that is lecture number thirteen. we shall finally be finishing off this entire chapter which is cell the unit of life so before we do that let's quickly see what we did in the last lecture lecture number 12 with regards to the prokaryotic cell we first revised something that we had done way back in lecture number 3 so in lecture number 3 we had seen the difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell we saw that a true organized nucleus is present in the eukaryotic cell but absent in a prokaryotic cell in a prokaryotic cell there is no membrane surrounding the genetic material and that area is simply called as nucleoid the nuclear membrane is present in a eukaryotic cell absent in a prokaryotic cell the nucleoplasm is differentiated from cytoplasm in a eukaryotic cell not differentiated continuous in the case of a prokaryotic cell we saw that a eukaryotic cell always has more than one chromosome whereas a prokaryotic cell will only only have one chromosome we also saw that eukaryotic cell shows linear dna whereas a prokaryotic cell will show circular dna a nucleolus involved in protein synthesis is present in the eukaryotic cell and it is absent in the case of a prokaryotic cell so this is what we first revised from lecture number 3 then we went on to discuss the prokaryotic cell a few features there is no well defined nucleus in a prokaryotic cell the genetic material is basically naked not enveloped or enclosed by a nuclear membrane the fluid matrix filling the cell is called as the cytoplasm of the prokaryotic cell they are generally smaller and multiply more rapidly than eukaryotic cell they may vary greatly in size and shape the organization of all the different types of prokaryotic cell is fundamentally same organization is same even though they exhibit such a wide range of functions wide range of functions and all prokaryotic cells except mycoplasma are going to have a cell wall because they have a rigid cell wall made up of peptidoglycans as you now know their shape is going to be fixed whereas the mycoplasma which are the smallest living organisms can change their shape so this entire paragraph that you see here is directly from the ncert textbook right then we moved on to the next part which was that the prokaryotic cells are generally available or are generally in three main groups you are going to have the bacteria the blue green algae also called as cyanobacteria and you are going to have the mycoplasma which is also called as pplo pleuronemonia like organisms so NCERT has just given this much information but in the last lecture i had elaborated more about all of these things with you so what did we discuss we saw that bacteria are available in a range of shapes for example they may be spherical in which case they are going to be called as coccus if they are singular they will be called monococcus if they are in groups of two or in pairs of two they are called diplococcus if they are in groups of four they are going to be called as tetracoccus if they are going to be bundled together one on top of the other tightly packed and bundled together they will be called as sarsina in the case of them being like a bunch of grapes they will be called as staphylococcus and if they are in the form of a twisted chain they will be called as streptococcus so these are the various types of cocci spherical bacteria moving on to those which are rod shaped which are called as the bacilli singular is bacillus plural is bacilli 
If they are simply single celled, then they will be called bacillus. If they are in groups of two or pairs of two, they will be called diplobacillus. If they are going to be in the form of a twisted chain, they will be called streptobacillus. And if they are arranged like a fence, like the wooden stakes of a fence, then it is going to be called as palisade. That brings us to the last category of bacteria as far as their shape is concerned. You have the curved bacteria, which if they are comma shaped are called as vibrio. If they have a fixed spiral shape, they are called spirilli. And if they have a spiral shape, which is a little flexible, then they can be called as pyrochetes. So this dear students is the entire chart of the various shapes of the different kinds of bacteria. Now, moving on to cyanobacteria, which are also called as the blue green algae. I have told this to you before that it's a misnomer. It's a misnomer. These are single cell prokaryotic cell. Algae are also single cell, but they are eukaryotic and are classified under plants. So cyanobacteria are not algae. Cyanobacteria are sometimes called as blue green algae, but they are actually bacteria prokaryotic, whereas the term algae is now reserved for eukaryotic organisms, which are lower plants. They derive their energy through photosynthesis, but lack a nucleus or membrane bound organelles like eukaryotes and hence cyanobacteria are classified under prokaryotes. Cyanobacteria contain only one form of chlorophyll that is chlorophyll A. They do not have the other chlorophylls which higher plants may have. In addition, they contain a blue pigment which is phycocyanin and a red pigment which is called as phycoerythrin. The combination of phycobilin and chlorophyll, the blue pigment and the green pigment gives them their older wrong name which was blue green algae. So now you know why they are called blue green algae but they are not algae, they are bacteria or prokaryotes. Some cyanobacteria also have gas vesicles which contribute to their buoyancy. So I'd explain this to you that in some cyanobacteria, they might have pockets of gases inside them, which will ensure that they remain floating at the surface of the water in which they are present so that they can get maximum sunlight, right? Now, so that finishes off bacteria and it finishes off our uh, consideration about the cyanobacteria. The third category was mycoplasma. So what are these things? So in 1898, Nocard and Rooks, the French biologists, were the first to isolate an agent assumed to be the cause of cattle pneumonia, the lung disease, and named it as Microbi de la Peri pneumoniae. So this kind of lung infection, when they removed the specimen and were trying to observe okay, what was the causative organism, this is what it looked like. And it was affecting not only the lungs, but also the membranes surrounding the lungs, which were called as pleura. So the infection of the lung along with the surrounding membrane of the lung is called as pleuropneumonia. So here is another picture, which you had also seen last time of the pleura, the two membranes, which are surrounding the lungs in mammals. And in between there is a space which is filled with pleural fluid. So, in 1898, Nocard and Rooks were the first people who discovered that there was such an organism. Microorganisms from other sources or other animals which were suffering from pneumonia were having properties similar to the pleuropneumonia of the cattle. And soon they were together categorized as a group of organisms which was PPLO, pleuropneumonia like organisms. Their true nature was not known at the time. So they were just categorized under this group. Later, they were told to be or later their name was changed to mycoplasma sometime in the 1950s. Now what are the features of these mycoplasma? So mycoplasmal bacteria have been found in pleural cavities of cattle suffering from pleuropneumonia. They are often called as PPLO or MLO mycoplasma like organisms or pleuropneumonia like organisms. Mycoplasma are considered as the smallest independently living things or organisms. So they are considered to be the smallest living organisms capable of independent growth and reproduction. Important characteristics are they do not have a nucleus or any other membrane bound organelles and that is why we consider them as prokaryotic. The genetic material is single naked DNA. Ribosomes are of 70S type as you have studied in lecture number 7 that they are of the 70S type in prokaryotes. The cell wall is absent. So this is one of the only prokaryotic groups where you do not have a cell wall. And because of that, the plasma membrane will form the outermost boundary of these organisms. 
Due to the absence of a rigid cell wall, these organisms can change their shape and are called as pleomorphic. So they can change from a broad category, from spherical to oblong to various other shapes and cannot be categorized as cocci, bacilli or uh, spiral shaped like how you could do with the bacteria. So this is what we had done about mycoplasma. Then we saw that what you see here right now, what you see here right now is a plant cell and an animal cell. Animal cells are usually smaller than a plant cell and next to them here is the bacterial cell. So the bacterial cell is much smaller as compared to the eukaryotic cell but it can multiply much faster as well. If we were to enlarge this bacterial cell, we studied eukaryotic cells from the inside to the out. So we first did the nucleus, then the cytoplasm and the organelles, then the plasma membrane, then the cell wall. Here, as I told you last time, we are going from outside to inside. So in the prokaryotic cell, we will study it from outside to inside. Now, in this case, the bacterial cells we realized may be either motile or they may be non-motile. If they are motile, they have these filamentous extensions which are called as flagella. So I hope once again you can recollect from eukaryotic cell that eukaryotic cell has something called as flagella and something called as cilia. Both of them are going to help in locomotion. The cilia are absent in the prokaryotic cell. The prokaryotic cell only has flagella and the structure of the flagella is also much different as compared to the structure of a eukaryotic flagella. So, the bacteria can show a range in the number and arrangement of these flagella. So here, as you had seen last time, the various types of flagella, it may have one, it may have many, it may have a cluster at only one end, it may have clusters at two end, it may have the uh, flagella surrounding it completely on all the sides. So bacteria has a range in the number of the flagella it might have and how they are distributed along its surface. At the same time, we saw this diagram which clearly shows that the flagella is going to have a different shape as compared to a eukaryotic flagella. So bacterial flagella is composed of three parts. It will have the filament which is the longest portion and extending from the cell surface to the outside. It will have this second structure which is a hook which helps in the rotatory motion of this flagella. Please remember that the eukaryotic flagella do not perform rotatory motion. They have a whip like motion. Here it is going to be rotatory. At the same time, there will be a basal body which you now know can have either two rings or four rings depending on whether it is a gram positive bacteria or a gram negative bacteria, right? So this, this structure here is how the flagella is composed or what is the structure of a flagella in the case of the bacterial cell, prokaryotic cell. Besides flagella, they might also have pili or fimbriae which are surface structures but do not play a role in motility. So we saw that the fimbriae are small bristle like fibers and they help in attachment. And here you can see the bacteria with the fimbriae and in the other diagram on that side, you can see that those fimbriae are helping those E. coli bacteria which have the fimbriae to stick to the intestinal cells. So this dear students is fimbriae. Then we of course saw that the fimbriae also help in attachment to the various rocks as well if the bacteria are found in water. Now in addition to that the pili are elongated tubular structure so pili are a tube. With these tubes bacteria can connect to one another by a process called conjugation and they can pass on the material which they would want to go from one bacteria to the other. So in this diagram here that you see these two bacteria are showing conjugation via the single pillars for transfer of material. This dear students is going to be important in today's lecture and that is why I am repeating all of this so that you don't forget what we had done in the last lecture. So here you have a pillars which is a tube, fimbriae are not tube, they are fibers. These are tubes, tubes have lumen, through the lumen things can pass from one bacteria to another. So this is a process called conjugation with the help of the pillars, right? Okay. Then we saw that if this is a bacteria with the naked DNA, the black line which you see here is going to be its plasma membrane, is going to be its plasma membrane. Now outside the plasma membrane, it is going to have its cell wall and the cell wall we know now is of two types. It will either be gram positive or gram negative. 
outside that also you might have something which is going to be called as the glycocalyx and the glycocalyx can also be of two types it can either be a capsule a rigid capsule or a loosely attached structure which is going to be called as the slime layer all these three layers together can be called as a cell envelope and the cell envelope is a chemically complex layer which is made up of tightly bound three layers which you see here the three layers are tightly bound so even though there are three layers they act together as far as their function is concerned as one unit but there are three separate layers there is a plasma membrane which is the same as a eukaryotic plasma membrane phospholipid bilayer outside it you are going to have your uh, cell wall and then you are going to have your glycocalyx so each layer performs distinct function but they can act together as a single protective unit following this we did each one of them in detail so first let's like i said we go from outside to inside so we discussed about the glycocalyx the glycocalyx can be of two types it can either be a capsule or it can be a slime layer now both of them are made up of polysaccharides but the capsule is a thick layer whereas the slime layer is a thin layer the capsule is a well organized densely packed layer whereas the slime layer is an unorganized layer so capsule is tightly packed whereas slime layer is loosely packed and attached to the actual bacterial cell capsule protects against phagocytosis by the wbcs whereas the slime layer will prevent the bacterial cell from drying out it will prevent it from desiccation and it will also help in attachment so remember that the fimbria and the slime layer are both things which can help in attachment all right moving on so here we have a better diagram or an illustration for a capsule and this the one in green on that side is the illustration for a slime layer once again quickly let's see the differences the capsule is a polysaccharide layer both of them are polysaccharide layers capsule is thick well organized and tightly packed whereas the slime layer is thin unorganized and loosely packed capsule prevents phagocytosis whereas the slime layer is the layer which will help in attachment and prevent desiccation so that finishes the first part of the cell envelope which is the glycocalyx the second part which we saw was going to be the cell wall which determines the shape of the cell and it is rigid made up of peptidoglycans so it provides a strong structural support to prevent the bacteria from bursting or collapsing the bacteria can be classified into two groups based on the differences in the cell envelope and the manner in which they respond to staining which was developed by sir christian gram so that gram stain that color which is violet in color all right when you use it to stain the bacteria the bacteria will either be gram positive or gram negative gram positive or gram negative gram positive bacteria look like this they stain blue or purple gram negative bacteria look like the ones on that side which are going to stain red or pink so what color they will appear under the microscope depends upon their membranes which we had seen in great detail in the last lecture and which i will be revising again right now so we saw that this here is a complex chemical called as a peptidoglycan so peptidoglycan is what is the structure of this peptidoglycan you are going to have n acetyl muramic acid and you are going to have n acetyl glucosamine both of these are carbohydrates and if you join carbohydrates together in the form of a chain you will get a polymer which in this case will be called as a polysaccharide this polysaccharide made up of alternating units of n acetyl muramic acid and n acetyl glucosamine is called glycans basically they are called as glycan chains so here you can see we have two glycan chains we have two glycan chains now in these glycan chains you can see that they are connected by the peptide linkage or by these proteinaceous polypeptides so they are connecting them together so you can see here there is a chain in between connecting the two which goes from one unit of n acetyl muramic acid of one chain to the other chain where also it attaches to another unit of n acetyl muramic acid so these peptide chains are linking the glycan chains together and that is how you get the name peptidoglycan so peptidoglycan is a very unique molecule which is rigid and is found only in the case of bacterial cells prokaryotic cells okay so this is how peptidoglycans or the glycan chains can be connected together by those peptide linkages and they can form this entire dense network as you can see here so let's see how the peptidoglycans form the actual cell wall in the case of bacteria 
So in some bacteria, which are called gram positive, as you can see here, they are going to have a plasma membrane on top of which they are going to have tons and tons and tons of layers of those peptidoglycans, very densely, tightly packed together. All of them are attached or connected to each other with the help of tachoic acids. And you will have this structure here called as lipotechoic acids, which connect the entire cell wall of peptidoglycans to the plasma membrane, to the plasma membrane, which is below it. So this is the cell wall of a gram positive bacteria. Okay, so just so that you have more clarity, I had shown these diagrams as well. So here again, you can see that there are glycan chains which are connected together by those polypeptides and all of these glycan chains are stacked in the form of a thick densely packed layer of cell wall above the plasma membrane, which you can see in the diagram given below. In that you can clearly see that you have lipotechoic acids and these lipotechoic acids link the cell wall to the plasma membrane. At the same time, you have the tachoic acids which are going to link the various peptidoglycan chains to each other. So it will link the peptidoglycans. So this, dear students, is going to be the gram-positive cell wall or the cell wall of a gram-positive bacteria. Now, the cell wall of a gram-negative bacteria which you can see in the diagram below is slightly different. So how is it different? It has a peptidoglycan layer, the lower one, the gram negative one. It has a peptidoglycan layer, but it is very, very thin as compared to gram positive. At the same time, it has a outer membrane as well. So niche cell membrane to hai, but uske bahar, peptidoglycan layer ke bahar, aur ek outer membrane hai, which is also a phospholipid bilayer. So that, in the case of a thick peptidoglycan wall, you are going to have the lipotechoic acids. But if you see the lower one, the gram negative one, it does not have a thick peptidoglycan wall. So there is no need for the lipotechoic acids as such. So here you are going to see lipids, you are going to see porins, you are going to see polysaccharides and you are going to see phospholipids as compared to lipotechoic acids. So lipotechoic acids nahi hai, but uske Sivai, ye dusri sari cheeze hain jo outer membrane mein hain, which you can see the lipid proteins, the porins, the polysaccharides and the phospholipids. So with this, we can also see the differences in the case of the basal bodies of the flagella. So here I have shown you two diagrams. The one which is on this side is going to be a gram positive uh, bacteria, as you can see from its cell wall. And this one is going to be the gram negative one. Notice that the gram positive one is going to have a basal body with only two rings, whereas the gram negative one, because it requires more anchorage, is going to have basal body with four rings in its basal body. So that brings us to the differences between a gram positive uh, bacteria and a gram negative bacteria. Stains blue or purple, stain pink or red, cell wall is thick 20 to 30 nanometers, cell wall is about 8 to 12 nanometers. Cell wall is smooth, cell wall may be wavy. The peptidoglycan layer is thick, multi-layered, whereas here it is thin, single-layered. The tachoic acids and the lipotechoic acids are present, whereas they are absent in gram-negative. The outer membrane is absent in the case of gram-positive, but present in the case of gram-negative. That is why porins are absent in the case of gram-positive, but present in the case of gram-negative. Also, lipids and polysaccharide content is very low in the case of gram-positive. But since gram negative have an outer membrane, where per lipids and polysaccharides will be more. The flagella has two rings in the basal body in gram positive and four rings in the basal body in gram negative. Lastly, and most importantly, as far as the doctor is concerned, we need to know which bacteria is infecting the patient because the antibiotic, just ke baare aaj or seekhenge, the antibiotic, the medicine which is going to work on the bacteria is different. So as you can see in the last point here, in gram-positive bacteria, they are susceptible, marenge, with penicillin and sulfonamides, with penicillin and sulfonamides. But gram-negative will not die with these antibiotics. You need another category of antibiotics, which you can see there, streptomycin and tetracyclines. So this, dear students, is the difference between a gram-positive bacteria and a gram-negative bacteria. And I had shown you this diagram at the end of the last lecture 
to completely drill into your mind the difference between a gram positive bacteria and a gram negative bacteria. So as far as a prokaryotic cell is concerned, it is going to have a cell envelope. It is going to have three components in the cell envelope. You have the glycocalyx, the cell wall and the plasma membrane, all of which we have done last time and which I again revised word by word today. So you have the glycocalyx, which is going to be having two layers, either capsule or the slime layer, the cell wall, which might either be gram positive or gram negative. And you are going to have the plasma membrane, which is the same as that in the case of a eukaryotic cell. So what was remaining for today's lecture was going to be the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So those are the things that we have to discuss today. And that dear students brings us to today's lecture, which starts now. So everything that we did up till this point was a revision of the last lecture. And I hope that all those things are now once again fresh in your mind. So let's start with today's lecture. All right. Now, the first thing that we have to discuss is what you have here is a diagram of a prokaryotic cell or a bacteria showing a flagella. Now, as far as this diagram is concerned, the plasma membrane is selectively permeable in nature and interacts with the outside world. You already know that from the eukaryotic phospholipid bilayer model, the fluid mosaic model. And this membrane is exactly, like I said, structurally similar to eukaryotes. However, there is something unique about a prokaryotic plasma membrane. And that is what you see here in this box. So dear students, here you can see that the plasma membrane, the red line that you can see is showing these infoldings. Now from the very second or the third lecture, I have told you that please keep this in mind that whenever you see foldings, there is only one reason as to why you are going to have foldings. And that one reason is to, is to increase the surface area. Why would you want to increase the surface area? There are three things. Either you want to absorb something or you want to secrete something or you want to attach something. So we know that if plasma membrane mein aisa kuch in foldings ho raha hai, to function would be related to that. But in the case of eukaryotic cell, we do not have such infoldings in the plasma membrane. So these infoldings, which you see here, are going to be called as mesosomes. They are called as mesosomes, which are found in prokaryotes, but absent in eukaryotes. So a specialized differentiated form of cell membrane called mesosome is characteristics of characteristic of prokaryotes. And they are essentially infoldings of the cell membrane, infoldings of the cell membrane. So let's just enlarge that and see it in the next slide. So here you see an enlarged portion of the slide where you can notice that where you can notice that this red part is going to be the outermost layer, which will be the glycocalyx. This part which you see here is the cell wall and this is the plasma membrane. And you can see how the plasma membrane is showing these foldings. And because of these foldings here, here inside, you can have these cisternae, you can have these vesicles or lamella sheets, you can have tubes that can form here. So this dear students is going to be called as a mesosome. So a special membrane structure is the mesosome, which is formed by extension of the plasma membrane into the cell. These extensions can be in the form of vesicles, tubules or lamellae. And we do not know their function for sure. Till date, we are not sure as to what their function is. But based on the common sense things which I had told you earlier, okay, they are folding, so they will increase surface area. And surface area will increase only if you want to do one of three things. You want to absorb something, you want to secrete something, or you want to attach something. So these are the speculations which are surrounding the functions of mesosomes. So scientists believe that mesosomes may help in cell wall formation. They might help in replication of DNA and the distribution of DNA to the daughter cells. They think that they can help in respiration, production of ATP. They can help in secretion processes to increase the surface area of the plasma membrane and for attachment of enzymes. And in some bacteria like the cyanobacteria, they say that these infoldings, when they form vesicles, chodi chodi portly, they might form inside. Those might contain the pigments required for photosynthesis. 
So in those cyanobacteria type cells, those infoldings can be called as chromatophores. So have a look at the last point here. In some prokaryotes like cyanobacteria, there are other membranous extensions into the cytoplasm called chromatophores which contain pigments. So I understand that you might feel that ye mesosomes ka exact function kya hai, pe to sab kuch likh diya hai. And the reason why ye sab kuch likh diya hai is because we clearly don't know exactly what is their function. So we are just speculating. We are just, you know, hawa mein teer maar rahe ke it might be one of these functions. So that, dear students, is what you needed to know about the plasma membrane and these infoldings of the plasma membrane seen only in the case of prokaryotic cells which are called as mesosomes. Alright, let's move on. So once again, let's have a look at this prokaryotic cell and you will notice that there are a lot of these rounded structures which you can see inside. So you can see all these rounded structures that we have here, all of these rounded structures that we have here. Now, some of them are ribosomes, but majority of them are simply pouches of material which do not have a membrane surrounding them. So they are just pouches containing material, non-membrane bound. They do not have a membrane. Remember that a prokaryotic cell does not have membrane bound organelles. So just imagine that a clump or cluster of some compound just chutta in the cytoplasm. So these things which are unique again to bacterial cells are called as inclusions or inclusion bodies. So prokaryotic cells have something unique in the form of inclusions. The reserve material in prokaryotic cell is stored in the cytoplasm in the form of these inclusion bodies. So many of these structures which you see here are inclusion bodies. They do not have a membrane and they are storing something inside a prokaryotic cell. So it is just a cluster. So NCRT says that they are not bound by any membrane system and lie freely in the cytoplasm and they have given you example of these three inclusion bodies, phosphate granules, cyanofacian granules and glycogen granules. So these are the three types of inclusion bodies that they have mentioned. Also they have said that there is a fourth one as well which is the gas vacuole. Gas vacuole, do you remember we have done this just about 15-20 minutes back. Gas vacuoles are those things which are gas filled structures found inside the cyanobacteria which help in buoyancy. So this is what the NCRT says about these various inclusion bodies. Let me now tell you a little more about these inclusion bodies which the NCRT has not mentioned. So for example, if you talk about the phosphate granules, what is the function of phosphate granules? So of course the main function of phosphate granules is to act as a reserve of phosphate because phosphate P is the key ingredient of ATP. Are energy molecule adenosine triphosphate ka P P ATP ka P kya hai? Phosphate. So prokaryotic cell requires phosphate granules as phosphate reserves and for energy production. Glycogen granules is pretty straightforward. Glycogen is a type of carbohydrate, it's a polysaccharide and carbohydrates of course are food which will help in production of energy. Now these cyanofacian granules are going to be found in cyanobacteria. So easy to remember cyanofacian found in cyanobacteria and cyanobacteria will require carbon and they will require nitrogen if they want to make their own food. So these cyanofacian granules in the case of cyanobacteria are for storage of carbon compounds and nitrogen compounds. And lastly, something interesting which we have discussed before, that there are these gas vacuoles which are found in the case of cyanobacteria. Now listen to this carefully, they as you know will contain gas which helps in buoyancy, which I have said in today's lecture. But the interesting thing is that they are protein bound structures. Meaning that they have a membrane, but the membrane is made up of proteins. The membrane is not going to be a phospholipid bilayer. In fact, the membrane which surrounds the gas vacuoles do not have lipids at all. Negligible amount of lipids. So there is no phospholipid at all. There is no phospholipid bilayer. 
So yes, a gas vacuole may be membrane bound, but it is not the same membranes that we have been learning. The phospholipid bilayer nahi hai. So this has not been mentioned in NCRT, but I just want you to know because some of you might be thinking in your mind, kya re, cytoplasm mein chutta gas hai, to ye gas evaporate ho ke escape kyun nahi ho jata? Why is that gas still in the form of a uh, vacuole or a compartment inside the prokaryotic cytoplasm? So the reason for that is that it is bound by a membrane, but that membrane is not a phospholipid bilayer. So once again, membrane bound organelles are absent in the case of a prokaryotic cell. Ye baat sach hai, gas vacuole has a membrane, but we say that that membrane is very different from the membrane we are considering. So gas vacuoles have a, only have a protein membrane. They do not have a phospholipid bilayer. So this finishes everything that you need to know about inclusion bodies. So we have studied about the mesosomes, we have studied about the inclusion bodies. Now the other thing that is found in the cytoplasm of these prokaryotic cells are the ribosomes. And there is nothing to teach here because we have done all of that in lecture number 7. So I am just going to revise what we have done in lecture number 7. So what did we learn about ribosomes in lecture number 7? We saw that they could have a larger subunit which is 60S. They could have a smaller subunit which is 40s and both of them combine together to form a eukaryotic ribosome which is not 100s. I hope you remember 60, 40, 100 nahi hota hai. It is 80s. So prokaryot, uh, sorry, eukaryotic ribosomes are uh, 80s as you can see here. Once again, I would like to remind you that the S stands for Swedberg units which is going to be a property of the density, size and structure of the molecule. So this is not simple mathematics where you just take 60, 40, make it 100. You take it as 60, 40 and if it gets more condensed, then it is going to be forming an 80S molecule. Right. In the case of prokaryotes, you are going to have a larger subunit, which is 50S, a smaller subunit, which is going to be about 30S and they combine together to form a prokaryotic ribosome. Again, it is not 50 plus 30, 80S, but it is going to be 70S. So a prokaryotic ribosome is 70S or 70 Swedberg units. Clear? Okay. What did the NCRT say about the ribosomes when we were doing the eukaryotic ribosomes? Ribosomes are granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Palade. They are composed of ribonucleic acid and we had seen this that ribonucleic acid RNA is of three types. It is going to be mRNA, rRNA and tRNA. The ribosomes are made up of rRNA, ribosomal RNA makes up the ribosomes. Okay. So they are composed of ribonucleic acid and proteins and are not surrounded by any membrane. Please remember ribosomes are not membrane bound and are found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic may 70s, eukaryotic may 80s. Clear? Okay. The eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s and the prokaryotic ones are 70s. Each ribosome has two subunits, the larger and the smaller one. The two subunits of 80S are 60 and 40 and the two subunits of 70S are 50 and 30. Your S Swedberg unit stands for sedimentation coefficient and it is indirectly a measure of density and size. Both 70S and 80S ribosomes are composed of two subunits as discussed. Okay. So now what is written in the NCRT under the prokaryotic section? So whatever we have seen here, whatever we have seen here is from the section on ribosomes in the eukaryotic cell. What does NCRT write about ribosomes when you read the prokaryotic cell? So the NCRT says no organelles like the ones in eukaryotes are found in prokaryotic cell except for ribosomes. So ribosomes once again are the only common structures between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell. Both of them are not bound by membrane and both of them are not of the same type also. You have 70S in prokaryotes and 80S in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, ribosomes are associated with the plasma membrane of the cell. So in eukaryotes, ribosomes would stick to rough endoplasmic reticulum wala membrane. Since prokaryotic cell may aise koi membrane bound organelles hi nahi hai, it will stick to the plasma membrane. So in prokaryotes, ribosomes are associated with plasma membranes. Once again, not all of them, some of them may also be free floating in the cytoplasm. They are about 15 nanometers by 20 nanometers in size. 
This is something extra which is given under prokaryotic cell, the part which I have highlighted in blue. And of course they have uh, two subunits, one is going to be 50S, the other is going to be 30S and when they are combined together, they are going to be the 70S prokaryotic ribosome. Also as you know, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So this is the information given about ribosomes under the section of prokaryotic cell. Now there is one more line given about prokaryotic ribosomes which is a little difficult to understand today. It will require a little more knowledge of genetics for you to completely grasp this. So I am just going to mention it today. If you don't understand, do not worry. Once you have a little more knowledge about genetics, it will become very clear to you. But today you might have to just remember it even though you may not understand it fully. So which is the line? Several ribosomes may attach to a mRNA molecule or a single mRNA and form a chain. So if many ribosomes attach to mRNA, if many ribosomes attach to mRNA, it is called as a polyribosome or it can also be called as a polysome. So this line is easy to remember, but why it happens is something which you will only learn when you have more knowledge about genetics. So be clear if you see on the screen, this here is a mRNA messenger RNA. There were three types of RNA, mRNA, tRNA, rRNA. So this what you see here is a messenger RNA. And now what you will notice is that ribosomes, many ribosomes. So if you look at this part, you will see a larger subunit and a smaller subunit of 50S and a 30S joining together to form a prokaryotic ribosome here. So there is one, there is the second one, there is a third one, there is a fourth one. And after their work of protein synthesis is over, you can see that they are detaching. But here you have a mRNA, the red line, which is an mRNA with many associated ribosomes. So this dear students will be called as a polyribosome. This is how it appears in the electron microscope. This is how it appears in the electron microscope. So this line do not stress right now. Just remember it. You will understand it absolutely clearly with a little more knowledge of genetics. So just remember this line right now. Several ribosomes may attach to a single mRNA and form a chain called polyribosome or polysome. With this, we have finished plasma membrane and the various things associated with the cytoplasm, the mesosome, the inclusion bodies, and now we have also finished off the ribosome part. So once again, as far as the prokaryotic cell is concerned, there is the outer part, which is the cell envelope, which we have done. Today, we also just finished everything related to the cytoplasm. Please remember that membrane bound organelles are completely absent in the case of a prokaryotic cell, especially when we talk about the phospholipid bilayer wale organelles not found in the prokaryotic cell. So that brings us to the last part of the prokaryotic cell. Remember, we were going from outside to inside. So we have finished the cell envelope, we have finished the plasma membrane and the cytoplasm. So now the last part, which is going to be the nucleoid. The nucleoid, which is the single chromosome, which is not surrounded by any membrane. Thankfully, we have done everything about that in the third lecture itself. So once again, I would want to revise this with you that when we saw the difference between a prokaryotic cell or a prokaryotic nucleus and a eukaryotic nucleus, we had seen all the features of the eukaryotic uh, of we had seen all the features of the prokaryotic nucleus so true organized nucleus present true organized nucleus absent also called as a nucleoid the nuclear membrane is present in eukaryotes absent in prokaryotes the nucleoplasm is differentiated from the cytoplasm in the case of a eukaryote it is going to be continuous in the case of prokaryotes you will have always more than one chromosome in the case of eukaryotes and you will have only one chromosome in the case of prokaryotes. The eukaryotic cell will show linear DNA, prokaryotic cell will show circular DNA. Uh, a non-membrane bound organelle called as a nucleolus will be present inside the eukaryotic cell and the same thing is going to be absent in a prokaryotic cell. So these are all the things which you already know about the prokaryotic nucleus. So there's nothing more to do here. You already know all the major things. However, there is one interesting thing that we have to know about 
the genetic material in bacteria and that has something to do with this image here so this is one of the most famous images in biology and what you see here and if you can see there is uh, something scribbled below the diagram it reads as the beginning of penicillin and it has been signed by alexander fleming it has been signed by this person here who is sir alexander fleming he was the one who made the discovery of one of the most important things for mankind so his discovery was about antibiotics so what are antibiotics and what did he discover and how did it happen so sir alexander fleming was a british bacteriologist he was also a soldier in world war 1 so in his career he had seen a lot of soldiers die because when they got any kind of wounds during world war 1 they were not they did not die in the battlefield they probably must have got a bullet injury or they must have fallen down or they must have fractured their hands now whenever something like this happened and if bacteria started living in that part so i'm talking about 1914 1915 world war 1 was between 1914 and 1918 for those first four years so during that time sir alexander fleming who was a doctor and who was also working in the field hospitals as a soldier as a doctor who was also a soldier and working in the field hospitals he found that many people were dying and they were dying because bacteria were killing them and they had nothing which could kill the bacteria so he was researching about how to take care of these bacteria and that is why he used to study bacteria and he used to grow bacteria in his lab now the bacteria which he was commonly studying was staphylococcus staphylo bunch of grapes wala wo wala yes staphylococcus so he was basically doing research on that bacteria okay how does the bacteria grow what are the optimum conditions how do you grow it what is their structure so he was studying all of that and one of the most important attributes or should i say that one of his poor qualities was that he was a very untidy person you can see that in this picture itself too many things not labeled sab kuch ghich pich so in the year 1928 he had gone for a vacation with his family and he forgot to close all the windows of his laboratory and on one of the petri dish he was growing staphylococcus and he had kept it he had kept the window open and it was on a table next to the window now when he came back what did he find in that petri dish so he came back and this was the petri dish now it might not make much sense to you right now but it will make a lot more sense in the next 5 minutes so in this petri dish all right what he found was that these were the bacteria which he was studying staphylococcus somehow hawa mein udte udte kuch fungus ke spores a very common fungus whose spores are found in the air and it's extremely common and that was the penicillium notatum fungus the penicillium fungus which can also be commonly called as mold m o l d so he noticed that some mold had or some spores of this fungus had dropped onto his bacterial plate so what he noticed was this was the colony of the fungus penicillium notatum that is what he saw he also noticed that here were living colonies of the bacteria which he was studying staphylococcus but what i want you to observe now dear students is that in this zone in this zone in this zone there were colonies of staphylococcus ye fungus to baad mein gira idhar but yahan pe pehle se ye staphylococcus ug raha tha grow kar raha tha he found that here in this area there were dead colonies of staphylococcus ones which were living some time back were now dead so when he saw this dish he was shocked ke why are the staphylococci dead and the only explanation that he could possibly come up with was the fungus was secreting something 
in the aju baju ka surrounding medium which was killing the bacteria or inhibiting its growth now why would the fungus do this for its own survival if the fungus can kill aju baju ke living organisms by making some material which can diffuse into the surroundings then the fungus is the only living organism in that food wala area so fungus will get all the food so for the fungus making this chemical is going to be a survival strategy however it was killing the bacteria which were harmful to humans staphylococcus which was going to cause throat infections and was going to cause gangrene soldiers were dying because of that so those bacteria were dying because of the chemical which was produced by this fungus so this was quickly named as antibiotic anti meaning against and bios meaning life so antibiotic is the chemical which is against life produced by this microorganism which in this case was penicillium notatum so what are antibiotics it is a substance produced by one living microorganism which can kill or inhibit the growth of other living microorganisms what is an antibiotic it is a substance produced by one living microorganism which can inhibit or kill other living microorganisms so in this case the chemical which we got from penicillin which was uh, from penicillium notatum which was purified was called as penicillin so penicillin was the first discovered antibiotic from the microorganism penicillium notatum which was going to be a fungus now dear students as of today we know that penicillium notatum is not the only microorganism doing this there are many of them a few of them i have listed in this table you do not need to learn them right now but i have listed them so that you have an idea that many microorganisms make these antibiotics some of which you may have used in the last 5 10 years for diseases you might have had so just to name a few you can see here there is bacillus subtilis so it's a bacteria and since bacillus so now you know okay what must be the shape they are rod shape so bacillus subtilis will make an antibiotic called as bacitracin you are going to have these different kinds of fungus called streptomyces which are making amphotericin chloramphenicol tetracycline erythromycin streptomycin then you are going to have cephalosporium bacteria which is producing cephalothin so there are many many single cell microorganisms which make these chemicals which can kill other microorganism so for them it is a survival tactic but for us it is a life saving drug kyunki agar hum log ye chemical wo bacteria mein se purify karke nikalenge to hum bimariyon se bach sakte hain because we can because we can use this antibiotic to kill the bacteria which are growing inside us so i hope that this antibiotic what exactly is an antibiotic is now clear to you and this little history of antibiotic is also clear to you as to how sir alexander fleming discovered the first antibiotic in 1928 it was penicillin from the fungus penicillium notatum against the bacteria staphylococcus which he was studying clear okay so let's move on now this is the same diagram which i showed you before after a few years scientists started noticing that there were a few staphylococci which were now able to live in a medium containing penicillin matlab pehle penicillin se staphylococcus mar rahe the ab suddenly kuch aise staphylococcus dikhe kuch aise naye staphylococcus discover hue who were not dying in the presence of penicillin they were living and that means that they were resistant to penicillin so they had antibiotic resistance i hope you can understand why this is dangerous for us because we thought ki agar mere gale mein khich khich ho rahi hai if i have a throat infection i will have the medicine penicillin and they will die but if these ones which are resistant to penicillin are in my throat then i have no medicine because if i take penicillin they will not die so now scientists started noticing that there were antibiotic resistant bacteria 
bacteria which were resistant not dying in the presence of antibiotics so how did they have this property let's have a closer look how did some bacteria not all some bacteria develop this antibiotic resistance how did some bacteria develop this character i hope that you now understand this property ke wo bacteria penicillin se nahi mar rahe the was a character that they had and what do we know about characters from the previous lectures this character antibiotic resistance like all characters must have some gene which is controlling it so in the third and fourth lecture when we were talking about basics of genetics i told you that we have chromosomes on which we have genes and those genes are responsible for characters so in bacteria also if they have this character that they are resistant to antibiotics it must have some gene that gene must be written on some dna and that dna must be present on some chromosome i hope this is clear to you so this brings us to a very important conclusion which is that if some bacteria have this gene and all bacteria do not have this gene the gene cannot be in the nucleoid the gene cannot be in the nucleoid matlab wo dna ka tukda jis pe likha hai ki antibiotic resistance hai wo dna main न्यूक्लियोइड वाली डीएनए में नहीं है बिकॉज इफ इट इज देयर इन द न्यूक्लियोइड वाला डीएनए देन ऑल बैक्टीरिया विल हैव रेजिस्टेंस ऑल द बैक्टीरिया विल हैव रेजिस्टेंस बट ऑल डोंट हैव सम हैव एंड सम डोंट हैव व्हिच मींस दैट द सम बैक्टीरिया व्हिच हैव द रेजिस्टेंस दे आर नॉट डाइंग इन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ पेनिसिलिन मस्ट बी हैविंग सम एक्स्ट्रा डीएनए जो बाकी लोगों के पास नहीं है सो आई होप दैट दिस पॉइंट इज नाउ क्लियर टू यू the gene cannot be on the nucleoid or the single chromosome else all bacteria would show the character of antibiotic resistance so it cannot be on the main chromosome it has to be somewhere else that dna ka tukda with the gene is somewhere else so here again you can see a bacteria and in the center you can see that there is its nucleoid the gene for resistance to antibiotics is not present there that gene which is giving it ability to live in the antibiotic not die continue to live be resistant that gene dear students is found here can you see that small tukda of dna that gene is present there and that small tukda of dna which is not the main chromosome which is not the nucleoid it is other than the nucleoid that dear students is called as a plasmid is called as a plasmid so now it should be clear to you that plasmids are not chromosomal dna they are extra chromosomal dna plasmids main chromosome ke upar nahi hai chromosome se hatke hai so plasmids are extra chromosomal at the same time they are autonomously replicating this again you will learn in the future but right now it's easy to understand ऑटोनॉमस मतलब अपने आप रेप्लीकेट मतलब मेक अ कॉपी सो प्लाज्मेट्स कैन मेक अ कॉपी ऑफ देयर सेल्फ ऑफ देम सेल्फ ऑन देयर ओन विदाउट एनीथिंग टू डू विद द मेन क्रोमोजोम सो प्लाज्मेट्स आर एक्स्ट्रा क्रोमोजोम दे आर ऑटोनॉमसली रेप्लीकेटिंग कैन मेक कॉपीज ऑफ देम सेल्फ ऑन दे आर ओन विद नथिंग टू डू विद द मेन न्यूक्लियोइड एंड लास्टली एज यू कैन सी इन द पिक्चर दे आर मेनी क्रोमोजोम्स so they are also a chromosome but much 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 smaller in size so i can say that plasmids are extra chromosomal autonomously replicating mini chromosomes plasmids are extra chromosomal autonomously replicating mini chromosomes now here are two of these bacteria and you can see both of them have the same genes on the main circular chromosome or the nucleoid however one of them has a plasmid and the other one does not have a plasmid one of them shows antibiotic resistance the other one does not show antibiotic resistance because it does not have that gene for that character so the one with plasmids will have more characters 
Now, why is this so important to us humans? Why is it so important? Because here you have the one with the plasmid and with the antibiotic resistance and here is the one without the plasmid and does not show the antibiotic resistance. Now the thing is that plasmids are autonomously replicating. So look closely in this area, look closely in this area. Can you see that it has replicated, it has replicated and made a copy of itself. And today I told you that remember pili and conjugation. So ye wala jiske paas plasmid tha, usne ek copy banaya. And it made a pilus which connected to the other one. And now this plasmid can be passed on to the other one can be passed on to the other one and once that happens the other one is also with plasmid and the other one also now shows antibiotic resistance and this is why plasmids conjugation pili all of this is a huge problem for mankind because jo pehle penicillin naam ki dawai se mar rahe the ab nahi marenge because of this so this dear students is what I wanted you to know about plasmids. What does NCRT say about plasmids? In addition to the genomic DNA, the circular chromosome or circular DNA, many bacteria have small circular DNA outside the genomic DNA. These small circular DNA are called plasmids. Plasmids are extra chromosomal autonomously replicating mini chromosomes. The plasmid DNA confers certain unique characteristics to such bacteria and one of those which we just studied right now is going to be resistance to antibiotics and this is about as much as you need to know about plasmids at the moment the ncrt textbook in this chapter mentions a line which as they themselves say we will learn in higher classes so in higher classes you will learn that this plasmid dna is used to monitor bacterial transformation with foreign dna so you will not understand this line today. You will understand it when we do it in the future chapters of biotechnology in standard 12th. Okay, so that dear students completes everything that you need to know about the prokaryotic cell, the cell envelope, as well as the cytoplasm, as well as the nucleoid. So the only thing remaining now is what is the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. All the points which I will now be discussing we have previously seen in all the lectures we have done so far. So comparatively smaller, comparatively larger, the prokaryotic cell multiplies faster, the eukaryotic cell multiplies slower, the glycocalyx is present in the prokaryotic cell, absent in the eukaryotic cell, the cell wall if present, remember mycoplasma do not have, so if present it is made up of peptidoglycans and here if present, it is usually made up of cellulose or some other polysaccharide of that variety. You have plasma membrane which may show extensions called mesosomes and here those mesosomes are absent. However, in the case of prokaryotes, membrane bound cell organelles are absent whereas in the case of eukaryotic cell, membrane bound cell organelles are present. You have ribosomes of the 70S variety in prokaryotes and the 80S variety in eukaryotes. As far as the nucleus is concerned, true organized nucleus is present true organized nucleus is absent there is a nucleus like structure called nucleoid the plasma the nuclear membrane is going to be present in the eukaryote it will be absent in the prokaryotic cell the chromo nucleoplasm will be differentiated from cytoplasm in the case of eukaryotes will not be there in the case of prokaryotes always more than one chromosome will always have one chromosome here shows linear dna shows circular dna and nucleolus is present in a prokaryotic cell and is absent in a eukaryotic cell. So now, as you can see here, there are these four distinct parts. The first part is the general part. The second part, as you can see, is about the cell envelope or the cell wall. The third part is talking about the plasma membrane and the cell organelles. And the last part is the difference between the nucleus. This, dear students, finally finishes the chapter of cell the unit of life. I hope you have understood everything that we have done in today's lecture and moreover I hope that you have understood this entire chapter that we've just finished today. Thank you and God bless. Work hard. Be nice.